Oh my God. <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. I, I should put on a hat. <laughs> or flowers. No, no. no? <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe later. Where's the hat? But there is a hat lying on my bed. And don't tell me my bedroom is messy. Don't tell me. I don't, I don't need to be told. I didn't take a look. It's private. What? Sleeping rooms are private. I don't know. But I mean, I have a sister who I like very much. Uh, the only member of my family who I like who keeps saying, don't wear this hat. You look much more impressive without your hat. You want the hat? But I think the bread is a good branding tool. Because um, you have I've, I've looked up quite a lot of videos and you're always wearing the hat, right? But I sometimes don't. I mean, I don't have to. No, it's no. not grown to my head. <laughs> yeah, it so, wasn't a red hat. I was wrong. Because you had a red turban neck on in the black hat. That's possible. Anyway, you want it or you don't want it. I'll do whatever you say. Just leave it. It gives you a cool artistic impression. Makes it look cool. Whatever you say. So, I've prepared some questions. You what? I've prepared some questions. I am ready. And you can ask anything you want. It can be very embarrassing, can be... <laughs> Whatever you want, I'll, I'll answer it as But to answer this, so we are part of this governmental program for one month. We started some days in Washington DC where we got an introduction, an introduction what the government of state is about, some clue about the elections that are going on. We met with uh, one of the Google founders, uh, he's called the father of the internet. I mean, this man wrote history, if this is really true. But you are not part of this group, or are you? We both are. Yeah. Oh, you both are, but you are not. No, she, she's okay. the host. She's the host. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, okay, 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 sorry. Sorry. And then we stay here for two weeks in Detroit. Everyone is with the host company. My host company is Tecton. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll forgive you that. <laughs> <laughs> what is your host company? Uh, it's the Detroit Hispanic uh, oh. Community uh, yeah, Development. Yeah. I should probably say, I mean, as long as you're being hosted by Tecton, I mean, um, I hope that's okay, but to my mind that is an advantage, not a drawback. I, I probably represent a de very different point of view from the point of view that you may have been exposed to so far. And I think that's part of why it's important for us to meet, because I will not simply repeat what other people have said, but I may say, things that are different, some of which may be offensive. No problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then uh, we stay here until Sunday. Yeah. Then we move to San Francisco, spend a couple of days there. And the closing is that we participate at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Oh. But I always picture that maybe we, we meet Barack Obama. <laughs> Do you... No, the, um, never mind. There are too many people I can ask you about. I won't ask you right now. And how I know Fra Franz? Yeah. Um, I met him at TEDx Pannonia. Mm -hmm. He was a speaker there and I was a speaker there. And you have known him for quite a long time? Yes, we are connected on Facebook and I always see what he's doing and he's seeing what I'm doing. So we are in the same topic. But we didn't meet too much. In real life, I have seen him three times. Oh, really? Mm. I wasn't sure that you weren't a couple. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then he did see that I'm in Detroit, and then his, it came to his mind that we should meet. So it was Franz's idea. <laughs> yeah, Franz's idea was that we should meet. I'm, actually, I, I think I made something of a slip. I was a little surprised that some of the people you mentioned, like Pony Ride and things like this, didn't immediately say, well, you need to meet, meet Fritjof Bergman. But on second thought, I realized, no, 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 they wouldn't say that. They didn't suggest anything. No, no, no. They oh. just, this is us, and what you do is not so much interesting for us, so... Okay, but we'll talk about that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, I'm ready for any of your questions and whatever okay, so questions the question are. I already started. You are the pioneer since 1948. How does this come? Why do you... Are you 1984. 1984, yeah. 
Well, you could say actually, uh, if I'm you no, know, I'm open to take some time. So, I wrote a book, which is called On Being Free, uh, which was a big success, which is still being published. I'm still get royalty checks, mm -hmm. even though I published it in the 70s, probably before you were born, and close. But uh, in that book on freedom. I wrote a last chapter on freedom and work, so it actually goes back into the 70s. And you could even trace it back further than that. I uh, was teaching at Stanford and I got very interested in what was happening early on before, before Google was anything big, but I'm, some of these people were students of mine at that point, but Google was this small. Um, and I got very interested in technology, and uh, but I narrowed it down more and more to technology and poverty. And in one word, my big problem is poverty. Not so much unemployment, poverty, and not ecology and not all the other things, but they all play a great role. And I, of course, am involved with all kinds of green groups and God knows what. but. If you ask me point blank, what is you? What are you about, Fritjof? What is it? My shortest answer is poverty, and that of course means that I'm very involved with other countries other than the United States, and that should play a role in this conversation. Importantly, so uh, because I know what people are trying to tell you about Detroit, and we don't. You should know about me that I do stuff in India and in the Middle East, in Egypt and in Bangladesh. Oh, you did? How much time did you spend in India? Uh, only now for one week, but oh. I'm talking to my friend in India nearly every day. And um, I was in Egypt in the last two years, six or five times. Oh, really? No. Well, we have... How, how many days do you have? <laughs> because we have lots to talk about. I'm very interested in the Middle East. Uh, I've not been in Egypt, but I've been in India numerous times and I'm almost in daily contact with India. And right now there are big strikes going on and so forth and so on. So all of that's somewhat relevant to our conversation. But back to your question. I said I would try to answer your question. I, I, uh, I started by teaching philosophy. I, I had what some people consider to be a phenomenal career in philosophy. I was teaching at Stanford, I was teaching at Princeton, I was teaching at Berkeley, I was, oh, no, no, all of the big name places. But ultimately I decided very early, I decided in 1980, around the time Reagan was elected, I decided my topic was going to be work. And I had many, many friends, is this thing working okay? Who all said, you are ruining a beautiful career, you idiot. Uh, you, know, you are obviously something of a star in philosophy. Now, why do you want to talk about work or make work your topic. I mean, work is totally uninteresting. There's nothing of any importance that anybody can say about work. For God's sakes, stop doing this. And maybe in slight parentheses, I can say, that's part of a long story that you can hardly imagine how insulting and upset and irritated and obstreperous philosophers were when I decided, no, I was going to talk about work. They all said, no, no, don't do this. And my own department kept saying, this is not philosophy, whatever you are doing. This is you know, almost insulting that you do at work. I mean, this is a pedestrian subject. And I said, never mind. I mean, I don't mind what you say. I, I, th I think I know what I'm doing. So let me, let me, let me study work. And I started very early, that was even before then, I started to study, I started to write in the, the last chapter in the Freedom Book, which was published I think in 77 or 78, so a long time ago, 
was on work, freedom and work, which was very unusual for somebody to write about work in a book on freedom. But that is an answer to your question, when did I start? I, it started as early as that. And, and did, it, did you see in your family that work can lead to slavery or why were you inspired to do this? Oh, that is a, another question, so to say. Uh, I think we should be very honest with each other, okay? Uh, I, my background is partly Jewish. My mother was Jewish, my father was a, a Protestant, Austrian, evangelischer pfarrer, pastor. So I grew up somewhat schizophrenically. Uh, people have written novels about my family history because um, through this is a picture of my mother right up there uh, 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 the one in the in the garb and that that di was her disguise when she disappeared in order not to go to a concentration camp and she disappeared and hid and actually ended up working with American prisoners of war during the last years of the war when I was a child but if you really want to know the beginning <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, but you, if you don't mind, I will tell you. Uh, part of the real beginning was that I was kicked out of the gymnasium very early. Gymnasium is a secondary school, very competitive, very elitist, all of that. Um, and I was in a specially competitive one in Gmunden, which is Hulu. Anyway, uh, because of one thing and another thing, partly because I was half Jewish, but for many other reasons, some of which involved grotesque coincidences like that, I threw an apple uh, putz, the, the remnant of an apple, I flung through the classroom while I was in school, and by Freudian accident, it happened to land in, there were always a big picture of Hitler, and it landed in Hitler's face. Oh, wow. So I was out of that school right then and there within 10 minutes, yes. And that meant that because I had been kicked out of school, I started working on a farm. And I am forever grateful for that because I started very early. I started when I was 11, 12, 13 to work on a farm. By the way, with a French prisoner of war who was also working on that farm and other people and I can tell stories forever about what it was like to work not far from Munden, not far from Ischl um, on, on a farm and so my relationship to work in a way goes back all the way to when I was a child because I started working on a farm and I've worked many other things and then I came to the United States exactly when I was 19 and that had to do with something a little bit similar to what you're going through. I, I, I was given a, f a scholarship, I, I won a contest, <laughs> great contest. I, everybody was supposed to write an essay, that is, is worth mentioning. I, uh, there were everybody under 18 I think in Austria was writing an essay on the world we want. And the first prize was one year in a United States college. And that was me. So it was a future study. So, yeah, so I was, I was already interested then in what kind of society do we want. And I was a baby, I was 17 or something like that. Uh, but and I remember I mostly wrote about how terrible Austrian schools are, <laughs> which is all very true. Uh, but a lot of my essay was about what education should be instead of what education is. And that still is a big part of new work. You know, new work schools, even in Detroit and so forth. We can talk about all that. Did you work with Robert Jung? <laughs> that is so nice of you to ask. You are wonderful. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. No. But the most memorable thing about Jung and Fritjof And I hope you don't mind. This, uh, there will be boastings in, in no this conversation. So you do, don't mind. Anyway, Jung and I met in, in China. 
And he was there and I was there and I gave a talk and he came up to me afterwards and he gave me a big Jungian hug and he said, now I know why I came to China. <laughs> so he made my day. It was wonderful. Um, and uh, so, so yes, we knew each other. We did not work that closely together. But of course, Jung and Salzburg is very connected and so forth, and the Jung Library and all of that. And I'm aware of that, but I wouldn't say that we became friends. I think that would be presumptuous. But he was aware of what I was doing and he liked what I was doing. And of course, his f future workshops were something that made an impression on me and, it was, and I was related to similar things and I did similar things. But you see, uh, I'm now going to say something central and big and important and we'll have to refer back to it and I want you to remember the next sentence if you may. You look very intense, so this is very... <laughs> I'm like a sponge right now. It makes me very happy to see your face. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I decided very early on already and you asked me about the beginnings and so I'm now going back to the beginnings. I decided very early on that my task was going to be to develop a conception in detail from beginning to end from bottom up to the top of a very different society, of a different culture, of a, a, a different way of life. Oh, okay, that's not awesome. So, um, so that was, of course, very different from Robert. I mean, uh, I was already then thinking about, okay, what is an alternative economy? What would an economy have to look like to be an economy that is a humane economy? Uh, what uh, would a, uh, everything else? up to the highest level of culture. I mean, what sort of art do we really want? What sort of religion do we really want? All of that was from very early on part of my, as it were, topic. And that was way beyond anything that he was talking about. He, you know, he was talking about very specific, concrete things where people developed ideas about what this village should be like or this town should be like 10 years from now or something. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor, so I've not lost my train of thought, even though it may seem like that. Um, so, I won this scholarship to come to America. And what happened was very strange. I was assigned, just, you don't have to complete control over what you do right now. I didn't have any control over what I was doing. They said, you go to Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. And I said, okay. It turned out to be a Presbyterian college. And I was even then already a card-carrying atheist. Mm -hmm. So I was very, you know, so it was very, when, and I had quarreled with my father and he had kicked me out of the home because I was not a Christian. And I resisted Christianity, and I hated Christianity, and I criticized Christianity. So, there was, so I had a difficult time at this Presbyterian college. Uh, but they graduated me in no time at all. I think I was only there for one semester and one summer school. And I think partly, and I hope you forgive me saying that, but I was kicked out partly because I was really a difficult student. I remember vividly going like this at the end of a lecture and saying, well, hmm, I think there were four things wrong with what you just said. And I was, I was a difficult student. I was ornery, I was presumptuous, I was whatever. Yeah, I, I was not a quiet student. But I also, had, I also was a danger to this Presbyterian college because I liked women. And I had any number of girlfriends. <laughs> and uh, so they got rid of me partly because they wanted to get rid of me. Because I was upsetting their moral apple cart. But also because I was a difficult student. So they said go and gave me a, a Bachelor of Arts with summa cum laude and all of that. Um, 
Now, this is part of my life story, and, and, and you ask for that, so you're getting it. Um, so what happened is that I was 19, and I had graduated from college, and everybody else graduates from college when they're 22, 23, or something like that. So I felt I was way ahead of myself. That has everything to do with work, because I felt I had two, three years, sort of I was ahead of everybody else, so I was going to do things. So now, and this is really is relevant, um, I, for example, I saw the movie On the Waterfront, and two days later I applied for a job at the harbor of Portland, Oregon. And I worked as a longshoreman, and I joined the union, and I was a longshoreman for quite some time. By the way, if you're uncomfortable, sit on the floor, go get the pillows all over the place. This place is full of pillows. Get pillows, lie down. I'm sorry I don't have a couch, but do whatever you feel like to be comfortable, please. Get pillows galore. Thank you for your apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying that since before I became up here. Look, <laughs> sweet Romy, if this is too much, if I'm too long-winded, no, cut me short. Sweet really, I, I, I can cut it out. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's okay. It's, so interesting. Yeah, just it's not uninteresting. It's not we, boring. We, uh, if it's not boring, it's not okay. Because for us, it's connecting the dots. Yeah. Mm, no, I am. No, very consciously. So, I was working as a longshoreman. I did many different jobs. Some dangerous jobs. Longshoreman business was dangerous because I had to unload grain from trains and you had to use a big mechanical shovel and that mechanical shovel came flying back at you, huge plate of steel, and then you had to grab it and put it into the grain and boom, go out. And boom. Um, any number of people got injured, of course. <laughs> the whole business of, uh, how should I say, the safety, the security of workers became for me an issue. My relationship to the unions went back there. And maybe I can tell this story because it's not an irrelevant story. I was, I had made some money with boxing and I had made money in woods and I had money in all kinds of things. But I still, I was still a relatively thin 19 year old kid. And here I was working as a longshoreman and the other people were all like this. And I worked like I don't know what. And I remember, I will not forget until I die, one of the big union guys came up to me and he said, you don't work like that. We fought so we could work slowly. You work too fast. Stop, slow down. Yes, so, um, so uh, 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 that was my introduction to unions that they had fought not to work so hard and and you see the connection to work and to new work and to all sorts of things so uh, I, I did many things I again worked on a farm I worked in the woods I worked on lots of things uh, I, I worked in factories that played a role early on I mean I had these years where I felt I could do anything I was ahead of myself I was in advance I was beyond where I should be so and then something rather remarkable happened in, in retrospect, and I can tell stories and stories and stories about this. My life was a, a, a sequence of... Are you okay? Yeah, I'm trying to lean on this angle. No, that, but you can use it. You can sit in that electric chair, which is very comfortable. You want to come here? I'm good. I'm comfortable. Are you okay? Don't worry about me. As long as you're comfortable. I'll make myself comfortable in any way. It's absolutely up to you to make yourself comfortable. <laughs> yes. Okay, keep, keep talking. You're great. It's fascinating. Something quite amazing happened, which I, uh, I was just saying, uh, 
coincidences, amazing, astonishing things happened. But amazingly enough, even though I had studied almost no philosophy at all, because I was at Lewis and Clark College and they had one Protestant pastor teaching philosophy who knew absolutely nothing, and to, I, I kept always saying, no, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it wasn't like that. And somehow or other, I got a fellowship to go to Princeton. Don't ask me why or how, I don't know how. But I went to Princeton and, and I studied there. And I would like to tell one or two stories about that because they're very relevant to what happened later on. Um, I want to write a book about the advantages of ignorance, which for a philosopher would be a different, different sort of book. But it has everything to do with what happened at Princeton. I was somebody who had not studied philosophy at all. And at that point, there was no question, Princeton was the best department in the country. And the main person at Princeton at that point was, and there are books of his up there, C.I. Lewis, who was then the most famous American philosopher. I had never heard of him. Everybody else had knew all about C.I. Lewis, and everybody else was terrified of C.I. Lewis because here he was over 80 years old and teaching at Princeton you know, after his retirement from Harvard and so forth. But I had never heard of him before. So after many of his talks about ethics, my hand went up and I said, that wasn't bad. But I thought you were really very wrong about the following five points. Boom, 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 boom. And everybody was utterly aghast at the impertinence of Fritjof talking like that to C.I. Lewis. But I had never heard of him. So everybody else was intimidated. I was never intimidated. He just seemed like an old man who was a little past his prime and so forth. So now here's what happened. And, and, and this is a story that has to do with the rest of my life. Um, I decided I didn't like Princeton. It was too arrogant. It was too conceited. One way of summing it up was, and this has much to do with the rest of my life, that Princeton expected you to whisper because it was Princeton. And I didn't give a shit about Princeton. I, I was not intimidated. So I decided I didn't want to do that. I had been in acting before. I had made money acting. I had written plays. I had done all right with all of that. I decided to hell with this. This is not what I want to do. And so I decided to get out of Princeton, and I signed all the papers, returning my fellowship and all of that. Here I was in the top floor of the graduate school tower, and you can go and visit it, and that floor still exists, and I'm not lying because there is a tower, and I lived in it. And as I was packing, because I was leaving Princeton, I heard somebody come up, 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 up the steps. Who came all the way up to the top floor? C.I. Lewis. Uh, I'm almost crying telling this story, and I hope you don't mind. But the thing was that he said, you are not quitting philosophy. You finish. You finish this semester, at least. I'm not letting you leave. And that was because I had never heard of him before. And it was the advantage of ignorance paying off. So I, was, I said, of course, of course, yes, yes, I'll stay, uh, if you say so. And so I stayed in Princeton, and then I met Walter Kaufman, and Walter Kaufman became my mentor. It was very important for the rest of everything. I very often say, if it hadn't been for Walter Kaufman, I would be now sitting on some street corner in Manhattan with a hat between my legs collecting coins. He, very early on, defended me again and again and against when I was being impossible and I was being impossible many times. Not just with C.I. Lewis, but with other people. But Walter Kaufman you know, would say, no, 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 no. I mean, he's talented. Don't, don't kick him out. Wait, give him time, give him time. And so eventually I wrote a dissertation with Walter Kaufman on Hegel, by the way, uh, of which I'm still I, I rather like my dissertation, if I say so. And 
So I finished a PhD at Princeton and uh, I wasn't at all sure that I wanted to stay in philosophy. I wasn't at all sure of what I wanted to do. But in any case, I ended up with a job at Michigan, which at that point was a plum. Uh, but I wasn't sure I wanted any of it. And then I got an invitation to teach at Stanford, and I taught at Stanford, and I taught at Berkeley, and so forth. You all know all that. That's all written up a hundred times, so sorry to that one. But um, the thing was that, um, now back to your question, when I was at Stanford, I was aware of the fact that things were bubbling. That, that you know, the, the Silicon Valley was only about five miles from where I lived. And so I became in, interested in what these people were doing. And any number of them were students of mine. And if I say so, and I hope this doesn't sound too conceited, but I mean, uh, none of the really top famous, famous people but still, some of the people who were quite who became quite important in Google and stuff like that were students of mine, and I say it really there were some resemblances, and that's possible to mention. I mean that uh, I think they still do it. I'm not quite sure because I don't keep track of everything by any means. I'm very ignorant about lots of things. I'm very ignorant about Detroit, so I had reasons for saying advantages of ignorance. I'm hugely ignorant about things in Detroit. But in any case, um, they decided to do something where they gave everybody their Friday afternoons off. I'm talking about Google. And uh, on their Friday afternoons, people were encouraged to do something they really wanted to do. And I think it had some reason, some relationship to the lectures I was giving, but I have never claimed that and I wouldn't make a fuss about it. But that they do pay attention to people's talents and that they do encourage people to do something they are really interested in is a fact, and it's a fact still. Whether they do the Fridays the way they used to do or not, I don't care. And if I may say that in a sort of woo, big swoop, um, when I started teaching at Michigan, not long after that, I established, I guess, the first center for new work in Flinton, in Flint, sorry. That was in 82, 83, 84. So we're moving forward slowly, but we're getting there. And, uh, it was the first center for new work, and it had everything to do with the fact that 